It's February 15th, 1978 in Pensacola, Florida. A man has just been arrested. He will be caught in a stolen vehicle. He will run, be shot at twice, be tackled, and pistol whipped. But what authorities do not know is just days earlier, he took the life of a 12-year-old girl and they have no idea who this man is. The man that the Pensacola Police Department has under arrest is going under the alias of Kevin Misner. He is carrying $125, a stolen vehicle, and this man will not give up his identity. The man that is pulled over that will be arrested is driving a vehicle with no active headlights on. The police officer will run the tags and see that they come back as a stolen vehicle. The officer will try to place the man under arrest. There will be a shuffle, the man will break loose, run away, the officer will fire two shots at him, missing, and he will arrest the mysterious man. He will be taken downtown. With the mugshot that is taken, you can see that he is bruised on his cheek from being hit by a heavy pistol due to resisting arrest due to fighting. In the morning, he will be taken to the local courthouse where he will stand in front of a judge, still refusing to identify himself. Eventually, a deal was made for identification as the mysterious man would be allowed to make phone calls, but the police department would soon find out regardless of who this man was, and his name was Theodore Bundy, the FBI's most wanted man in America. This is where Bundy would make two famous phone calls. He would make one phone call to his lawyer under the name Rosebud. Bundy was obviously seeking help from someone that tried to prove his innocence in the past. The lawyer that Bundy was calling was John Henry Brown, his past lawyer that had helped him in previous cases. John would answer the phone call from Bundy. He would say that Bundy sounded crazed and worried on the phone, and was left with a huge ethical dilemma should he warn the authorities who they have in custody. But he did not. The next he would make to his girlfriend, Elizabeth. This is where Bundy would have that famous line. The conversation with him and Elizabeth would go on to say, He told me now that he knew that there was something that he couldn't be around. And when I asked him, what is that? He said, don't make me say it. So I knew that he meant young, beautiful women. Ted would say in later phone calls that he was controlled by dark forces he couldn't contain. So to understand how Bunny had got to this point, where he had met the end of his multiple years of kidnapping and killing and torturing. Let's go back not even two months ago. Bunny would escape prison for the last time. He would end up in Tallahassee, Florida, hitchhiking, catching rides, stealing vehicles. He would be there for a small portion of time, in and out of bars, stealing credit cards, stealing loose change, and talking to young college girls. But at this point, Ted is a much older man. His boyish good looks are not there so much anymore. He's starting to look like a rugged, older man. Now while Ted is in Tallahassee, he would murder two women and beat three more unconscious. All in the same night, all in the same hour. Now, what makes this so interesting? This is interesting because this is very out of the norm for Ted Bundy. He has never done anything like this in one night. We only know of one other case where he took two women in the same day. In this situation, when he attacks five women in one night, he is obviously mad. He is crazed. He is sloppy. He is out of his element. The Bundy we know of the past is a hunter. He's a stalker. He takes his time. The Bundy that has arrived in Tallahassee is older, sloppy, and completely out of his mind. Now it's important to note that Ted obviously has no job. He's not receiving money from friends or family. No one knows where he is at. There is a massive manhunt for him right now. And it's important to remember, this is three weeks just before Kimberly Leach would be taken from her school and murdered by Bundy. Going into the vehicle that Bundy would have is very interesting and very chilling. Bundy would steal a van from the Florida State University shortly after the Chai Omega slayings. Now what's important about this van is that it will have direct evidence in Bundy's next and last murder. At this point, police are on the look for a white van from Florida State University. Three weeks later, the day before Kimberly Leach vanished, Bundy was in Jacksonville. This is where an eyewitness would confirm seeing Bundy in a white van. A young woman, 14, she would cut across a Kmart parking lot. This is where Bunny would drive up on her, 
hop out of his van and start to make conversation with the girl, obviously trying to lure her into the van. This would take place on February 8th, the day before the Kimberly Leach kidnapping. The man was in a white Dodge van she later identified as Bundy. At the time, her brother, who was much older, drove up and challenged the man, causing him to flee and obviously saving his sister's life. Now at this point, we know that Bundy has a van. A van is the number one vehicle for most serial killers. Obviously because it's able to hide what's inside and also allows much room inside the vehicle. So Bundy at this point will use the van as his new hunting vehicle. The next day, the van will be identified in the parking lot of Kimberly Leach's school. When the van is finally found with Bundy, it will have soil samples and leaves found in it that agents will identify as the same location where Kimberly Leach was found. In the van, agents will also find hotel receipts close to where Kimberly Leach was taken. But going into the story of Kimberly Leach, this will be the last and final murder of Ted Bundy. It's important to understand there's still so much that we do not know of the situation. There's only bits and pieces that frankly are not even described by Bundy himself. Bundy would not talk about this. And when he finally started to confess to murders, this is one that he would not talk about. Even though there was plenty evidence, all that Bundy would do and say about the murder is that he did do it, but would go into no detail of before, during, and after. With the case of Kimberly, mostly what we know are from eyewitnesses and evidence found. We know that Kimberly was taken in the middle of the day from Bundy, that he was walking around the school, and that he was actually seen by a firefighter walking with Kimberly, holding her arm, walking towards a white van. Now the witness would actually say, when he saw Bundy walking the girl by the arm, he thought the girl was in trouble and that Bundy was her father, taking her to the vehicle. Court documents would say this about the kidnapping of Kimberly Leach. The defendant kidnapped her from the said junior high school sometime from 9 and 10 a.m. on February 9th, 1978, and her deteriorated body was found in a hog pen approximately 45 miles from the scene of the abduction on April 7th, 1978. The victim died of homicidal violence to the neck region of the body. At the time the body was found, it was unclothed except for a pullover shirt around the neck. Bundy's DNA was found on Kimberly. Also, blood was found on the blue jeans near her, and there were tearing rips in some of her clothes. The court finds this kidnapping was indeed horrendous, atrocious, and cruel, in that it was extremely wicked, shockingly evil, vile, and with utter indifference to human life. Now the only thing that came out of Kimberly's death was that it would bring Bundy his own death. Bundy would first go on trial for the Florida murders of the Tallahassee women in the sorority house that he had attacked and murdered. In the end of that case, the main thing that would lead to his conviction were bite marks. Just some time after that case, he would go to trial again for Kimberly Leach, and in that case, he would be found guilty. In the end, when Bundy was finally caught, he had confessed to 30 murders of women and young girls. To this day, there are still cases connected directly to Ted Bundy, with time, location, and same kind of murders from women when Bundy was on the loose. On January 24th, 1989, at 7 o'clock in the morning, Ted Bundy would awake sometime that morning, be washed, be prepped, and walk to the last chair that he would ever sit in. He would be executed that day for the murders he had committed in Florida just some time ago. He was 42 years old. It's important to remember in this, Bundy is a psychopath. He feels no sympathy. Someone's terror is his pleasure. In the end, it's hard to say if Tim Bundy was actually sorry. While sitting in the electric chair, Bundy was asked if he had any last words. He would say, I'm sorry for causing so much trouble. We know that Bundy said in his last interview that as a young teenage boy, he would see magazines, seeing women being tied up, assaulted, and just downright tortured. Bundy said this was a key moment in his childhood that would bring up the impulses, bring up the thoughts, bring up the desires to do what he did. That would later to progress into other things in his adulthood. There's still so much we do not know about Bundy, and frankly, we'll never know. But there is no doubt about it that Ted Bundy was one of the world's most calculated, repulsive, and brutal serial killer in American history. Friends, with all that said,
Be careful who you take rides from. You never really know who you're talking to.